You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good Monday so far. I uh, wanted to talk about something that I saw over the weekend, some comments from Cardinal Holeric, um, who's the Realtor General of the upcoming Senate. And so I wanted to talk, well, engage his comments, talk a little bit about the Synod and whether or not we can expect changes in the church's teachings, especially related to moral issues. Um, and then I want to respond to, I think, some liberal commentary that I've seen on the comments of Oleric, and then also some more radical traditionalist commentary that I've seen on it, because I think both are wrong. Um, let's start by watching the video. I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if you cannot hear it. But you should be able to see it now. Let me maybe maximize it. It's a little hard to hear. So let's let's read the subtitles here as well as listen to it. Please let me know in the chat if there's any difficulty, however. It's a very short video. Uh, let's watch the whole thing and then maybe I'll... Uh, started over and off for some commentary. But since it's only a minute long, let's watch the whole thing first. And I would like to ask you a very clear point of question. After the do you believe that sodomy should be considered a great sin? Um, I do not know what the senator brings. We now listen to the people of God, what they express. I start getting in reports, as you know, the Redentor General. Of the Senate. And so, reading all of that, in September we make a first draft for the continental meetings which will take place. I think that, uh, uh, first of all, I would never consider sexuality separated from love. The Bible has taught, that was taught for 2,000 years, that sodomy is a sin, an abomination to Christ. But the Bible also said that we should stay with a woman who is an actress. The Bible has said that uh, the sun turns around with the earth. So the Bible is after that given interpretation to women. So the fundamental scriptural teaching on sin. This is not a theological. No, 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 no. It is, uh, I know that I am in full agreement with Pope Francis. Thank you, friends. All right. I know it's a little hard to understand that because of the audio that we have from the source here. Um, I'm going to go through this and I'll try to repeat what they're saying and then interact with it. But I hope that's at least sufficient um, for us to get started here. Let me uh, offer some interaction with what the Cardinal is saying, because I do think that there are some problems to what he's saying, whether he realizes it or not to me doesn't matter because I think when you're a cardinal, you should know better. So I think somebody who's already formed in theology and is in a position of especially being a cardinal, one should already know better. So I can't say that, well, you know what, he's just ignorant. Well, you know what, he doesn't have the luxury to be ignorant about these things. So let me charitably interact with him. So I appreciate this guy, whoever he is. I appreciate that he's asking very straightforward questions. I also appreciate that he's being charitable. I don't know who this guy over here is, but it seems like he got upset by some of the questions, uh, which I found to be interesting. I'm also grateful that the Cardinal is actually trying to, attempting to offer some answers. Um, that's somewhat refreshing since I, I have noticed that some bishops are evasive when it comes to these questions not that some of his answers might not be evasive 
But I mean evasive to the point that they won't even allow themselves to be on camera and answer these questions. So I at least appreciate that the Cardinal is willing to do that. Uh, but I do think that his position um, uh, fails in the end. But allow me to explain why. Uh, this lay Catholic, presumably, is saying, I would like to ask you a very clear, pointed question about that. Presumably, uh, the Synod on Synodality um, and its perspective and position and what, what all is going to be discussed as far as uh, the ability of synods to modify doctrine locally um, with a, with interest, especially with the Germans who want to modify the church's teaching in relation to same-sex unions and same-sex acts. All right, so let, let's continue. Watch what's said. I'd like to ask you a very clear point of question. After the synod, do you believe that sodomy should be considered a grave sin? That's what is asked to the cardinal. Do you believe that sodomy should be considered a grave sin? Um, I do not know what the synod will bring. We will now listen to the people of God, what they express. I start getting in reports. All right. He replies, I do not know what the synod will bring. We now listen to the people of God, what they express. I start getting in reports. Well, a couple of things here. First of all, the synod is not able to change doctrine, which I'll show here in a moment. So whatever the synod brings, it's really irrelevant to his question. Uh, because his question related to is the teaching of the church on same-sex same unions immutable? The answer to that is going to have to be yes. Um, so what the synod says is kind of irrelevant here because a synod doesn't have the authority to overturn definitive teachings on morality. Um, the magisterium itself also does not have that authority, of course. Neither do I believe that the magisterium will actually attempt to do so, um, since even the non-definitive teachings of the church are protected by the Holy Spirit insofar as they will be safe, theologically safe. So you would not have something in them that is going to be destructive to souls if one were to give religious submission of intellect and will to them. So the magisterium itself won't even be able to or will even try to overturn this. Now, what you will have are individuals who are members of the magisterium who will try to overturn it. And here I'm talking, when I say the magisterium, I'm not talking about a local bishop in their magisterium. You can have all kinds of bishops locally saying all kinds of heretical things. I'm not talking about that. When I refer to the magisterium here, I'm talking about the universal magisterium and its universal organs. So the Pope speaking universally or an ecumenical council speaking universally. I'm not talking about a local bishop uh, teaching in his local magisterium. That obviously, you know, somebody in that situation could teach heresy. Um, even local councils and local synods, whenever they carried magisterial authority in church history, um, even those can be heretical. And that, that's obviously happened multiple times. I mean, just think of Ephesus 449. Uh, and I could give many, many other instances. There, there are iconoclast synods that have taught against, um, uh, you, know, you know, the orthodox understanding of icons. Um, so against the iconophiles. So that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about the magisterium won't try to change. I'm talking about the universal magisterium. So the Pope won't in a universal document, even if it's non-definitive, say something that would completely overturn the church's teaching or at least attempt to. Uh, that that won't happen. So I that's where I part ways with some uh, conservative and traditional commentators who will say, well, the church can't overturn this teaching, but it could teach something in its non-definitive teachings that's um, contrary to tradition. I, I want to say, wait, um, no, that, that's that's also not true. Um, that's, that's somewhat just as problematic as the liberals who are trying to overturn the church's teaching here. Those who are conservative who are offering that commentary, whether they realize it or not, they're offering me a position that's just as untenable as a liberal who tells me, ah, the church can change its, change its teachings on morality here. Uh, so I want to say both of those are wrong. Um, but he says, we listen to the people of God. Okay, all right. Uh, some some of the people of God are wrong, though. <laughs> I mean, we, we do need to listen to them, obviously. Um, but sometimes they're wrong. So that doesn't answer the question on whether or not this would change after the synod. 
Um, he says he starts to get in reports. Let's continue. To you know, the Major General of the Senate. And so reading all of that, in September we make a first draft for the Continental Meetings, which will take place. All right, so he's saying, as you know, I'm the Realtor General of the Senate, and so reading all of that in September, we make a first draft for the Continental Meetings, which take place. So he he will, you know, have a hand in offering a first draft in the Senate. Now, obviously, the first draft is probably not going to be what's going to be accepted anyway. Uh, they they usually go through multiple drafts. But moreover, uh, the Synod actually has no magisterial authority, which I'm going to demonstrate here in canon law. Um, that that's just that should be common knowledge. Um, so even what the final result is, the final draft of the Synod carries zero magisterial authority. What does carry magisterial authority is what the what the Pope promulgates after the Synod. He will look at the report see what the bishops are saying, and then he will make a decision on what he is going to teach in his magisterium. And here, I, I'm, I'm once again saying even in his non-definitive magisterium, so outside of ex cathedra, uh, in his non-definitive universal magisterium, um, he might propose something that's non-definitive, but that doesn't mean that it would be destructive to souls if one were to assent to it. So I think that at the end of the day, we can rest assured the church's teaching is not going to be changed. It's not even going to be attempted to be changed in the magisterial document. However, I am sure there will be plenty of bishops who will try to promulgate locally in their diocese an alleged change or will teach an alleged change in their own diocese. I, I'm certain of that. Um, what else is new? We've had that problem from day one. And yeah, I think that it is a problem. I do think that we need to uh, exercise church discipline in those cases. But, you know, that's ultimately going to fall on, on, on those who are in authority to exercise church discipline. Um, but there have been many, many cases where bishops have maintained all kinds of things that really they had no business um, teaching on and proposing in their local diocese. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to continue to have this same problem. However, regardless of how this goes down with the Synod on bishops, um, I don't think that anything is going to happen to the church's magisterium. Um, so I want to say that's excluded. But just because the church's magisterium won't attempt to change this doesn't mean all of our problems go away. Because as I'm saying, the church, the magisterium can remain intact, and yet you could still have bishops that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing and are not teaching in accord um, with the church's teachings. So that's going to be just as destructive it, practically as the church changing its teaching. It's not the same because the church is indefectible here, so it's, it's unable to. Um, but I'm just saying practically, you don't have to change church teachings to destroy souls. You could just simply corrupt souls by false teachings on a local level and not, not exercising church discipline. That could certainly corrupt souls. And frankly, that's all Satan has to do. He doesn't have to worry about changing teachings in the magisterium. He just simply has to corrupt souls um, in a lower level than that. Uh, so... Uh, and it is true he is the realtor general, but we're going to look at what his role is here in just a moment, um, according to the Vatican, what that means that he's a realtor general. But let's first continue uh, with the video. I think that, uh, uh, first of all, I would never consider sexuality separated from love. All right, so he says, I think that, um, first of all, I would never consider sexuality separated from love. This is what I call deflection. Whether intended or not, it's deflection. It's entirely irrelevant. Nobody is asking the question, is sexuality separated from love? Although I think we could challenge that as well. What, what kind of love? Um, I would imagine there are some sexual acts that they're not separated from love, but they're disordered love right it's a disordered form of love so uh, it's irrelevant whether or not sexuality is separated from love the question is what kind of love is it is it a proper order of love is it a proper application of love those are the kinds of questions we need to ask this is a red herring this is a rabbit trail it has nothing to do ultimately with the question
doesn't matter if you think that sexuality is not separated from love. That does not impact whether or not um, same-sex acts are disordered. Because again, one might be employing um, uh, a disordered form of love in these sexual acts. So again, it's, it's a red herring. <laughs> So I, anybody who goes down this route with me, I, I already know, you, you know what, you're, you're, you're deflecting. Whether you realize it or not, you intend it or not, you're not really engaging the question. Um, and I, I, I could say I do suspect whenever a person goes down this route that they might be intentionally deflecting. I don't fully commit to that because it's hard for me to read a person's heart and read their intentions. But it's definitely suspicious <laughs> because it's it's such a red herring that you just kind of have to wonder if, if they're not intentionally being evasive. Um, so this is irrelevant. You know, we can go down that rabbit trail and still not going to lead to the question that is being asked by this layman here. Still not going to address his question. <laughs> The Bible has taught, has taught for 2,000 years that sodomy is a sin, an abomination. All right, so he he's responding respectfully. Hey, look, kudos to this layman. And you know what? Kudos, again, also to the cardinal insofar as he's allowing himself to be filmed and he's trying somewhat maybe uh, to answer the questions. <laughs> he's at least doing more than most most that I've seen. Um how, however, obviously, I, I do think that the, the cardinal is, is problematic. But um, kudos to the layman being respectful. I appreciate that from him. But he's being straight to the point. He's not going down that rabbit trail with the cardinal, uh, probably because he's limited on time. I wouldn't go down that tra rabbit trail either. I would stick to the point. He says the Bible has taught the church has taught for 2000 years. Er, the Bible has taught and the church has taught for 2000 years that sodomy is a sin an abomination that cries out to heaven. Now, here's what the cardinal says in response. <clears throat> but the Bible also has said that we should stay with the woman who is an idol. The Bible has said that uh, the sun turns around the earth. So the Bible is after the given interpretation. All right. So he says, but the Bible also said we should stone the woman who is an adulteress. The Bible also said that uh, the sun turns around the earth. So the Bible is has to interpret, give an interpretation to the Bible. That's what he says. Okay. First thing here. Um, the Bible says that we should stone a woman who is an ad adulteress. Okay. Does that mean that adultery is no longer intrinsically evil? What does this have to do with the question he's asking? He's giving you the impression that, well, since we don't stone adulterers anymore, that I guess the church's morality could change. That does not logically follow. Because adultery is still a sin. The question is, how do we respond to somebody who's in adultery? That's a disciplinary question. But is adultery still adultery? Is it still a sin? Is it still intrinsically evil? The answer is yes. So that doesn't engage the layman's question, which is on whether or not same-sex acts are intrinsically evil and sinful. We're not asking, how do we deal with them? We're not asking, do they need to be stoned or something? That's not the question. The question is one of morality in the act itself, whether or not it's immoral. So again, the stone of the woman has absolutely nothing. Stoning a woman who is an adulteress has absolutely nothing to do with this because we've now shifted categories. We're now talking about discipline versus the actual sin. And even in the case he brings up, it's still a sin. Moreover, he brings up an instance of how we used to deal with this as far as discipline in the Old Covenant. And there were reasons for why we needed to do that then. And there's also reasons why that has changed in the New Covenant. The teaching on adultery has not changed, but how we deal with adulterers has changed um, since much of our context has changed in society. So that's a disciplinary question. So yes, the, the New Covenant has overturned or fulfilled, I should even say, how we respond publicly to some of these things, but it hasn't overturned the morality. Moreover, we are not dependent on the Old Testament for what the church says or what the Bible even says about same-sex acts. I get the impression the cardinal thinks that this is just something from the book of Leviticus. 
But unfortunately, I hate to break the news to people who might not know, but it's actually the New Testament that confirms the immorality of same-sex acts. It's not just something from Leviticus that's somehow no longer applicable in the New Covenant. The stoning of individuals is no longer apl uh, applicable. But in the New Covenant, the acts, same-sex acts, are still considered gravely immoral. And you can see this in the book of Romans, chapter 1, and you can also see this in the book of 1 Corinthians, among others. So the cardinal is not engaging the New Covenant's teaching and the New Testament's teaching and God's teaching on same-sex acts. I also suspect that he might be presuming that there are errors in sacred scripture, that what scripture proposes could be erroneous. I, I, I get that suspicion by the next example he's going to try to use. I don't believe that there are errors in anything that the sacred author proposes. I certainly think that there are many misunderstandings, but anything that the sacred author proposes, the Catholic Church teaches, and I would argue definitively teaches, based on the Council of Trent. And it sure seems Providentissimus Deus, Leo XIII, confirmed that Trent definitively taught this, that the sacred author can't propose anything that is contrary to truth. There aren't any errors in Scripture. Scripture is inerrant. And, and I kind of get the impression that the cardinal probably doesn't maintain that, which is a problem in and of itself. So let's just say the cardinal is great on everything, on the church's teachings on morality. I'm concerned about his understanding of Scripture. Uh, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, so once again, the old covenant discipline on adulterers doesn't change that adultery is immoral. Therefore, it doesn't change whether or not same-sex acts are immoral. Moreover, the new covenant confirms in the New Testament the immorality of same-sex acts, just as it does adultery. Um, so he's not engaging that. He also says the Bible has said that uh, the sun turns around the earth. All right. Is the sacred author actually proposing scientifically that the sun turns around the earth? Is he proposing that? Or is the sacred author just simply describing a situation with how it appears to the senses? Phenomenon logical language, as it's called. It's a mouthful. Phenomenon logical language. <laughs> right? How, how it appears to the senses. I argue that the sacred author is simply describing how it appears to our senses. He's not giving us a, 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 an answer on how science works or how the universe works objectively. He's simply describing how it appears to the senses. So a sacred author speaking about how something appears to the senses has absolutely nothing to do with the New Testament's teaching on the immorality of same-sex acts or the church's consistent teaching on the immorality of same-sex acts. Once again, we're going down a rabbit trail. Seems like deflection. And it's a really bad analogy because it's not analogous in any way. And then he says, so the Bible is or has to be interpreted. Well, that's certainly true. If <laughs> We have to have an interpretation to the Bible. I mean, here I'm in agreement with the cardinal, sure. But hasn't the church already interpreted scripture on this? Not that we even needed the magisterium to interpret what scripture teaches about the immorality of same-sex acts because those are explicitly condemned. So you don't really need an interpreter there. But just in case it's unclear to somebody, the magisterium has consistently taught against this. So the magisterium has interpreted it. And it's not in favor of the idea that it's moral. And it's interpreted as definitively immoral, not, not just, you know, for our current circumstances, it's immoral, but it could change later on if the people tell us in it, we think that this should change. Which people? Sinful people who are not actually living in God's grace? People who are living in God's grace? Neither one of those would be able to overturn any of this anyway. And I understand the sense of the faithful. Believe me, I understand that. But I don't think the sense of the faithful can be used here to overturn anything. Um, plus, you can't use the sense of the faithful to contradict the magisterium's consistent definitive teachings. That's not the sense of the faithful. Period. 
Um, so once again, I want to say this is an act of deflection, whether it's intentional or not on his part. Don't know. Don't care. I'm going to give him the judgment of charity and just think that, well, he doesn't intend to deflect. But at the end of the day, but you did deflect. So that's the problem. See, th this guy over here seems to get upset. Uh, let me read what he said. The layman respectfully asks, so the fundamental scriptural teaching on sin is being changed. And then the assistant immediately wants to say, no, 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 no. this is not a theological, and that's it. In other words, this isn't a theological debate. Well, no, it's not a theological debate. Um, this is a legitimate question that a layman is asking. I think to say, oh, this is not a theological debate. And to try to avoid the question at this point is being evasive and is not being fair to people when they're asking sincere questions. So the guy over here in the middle, I don't know what his deal is, but... I think that he's taking the wrong approach here. Just simply trying to avoid the issue is not helping anybody. Um, so the Cardinal says, no, 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 no. There's a, uh, I know that I'm in full agreement with Pope Francis. What does that mean? <laughs> what, what does that mean? You're in full agreement with Pope Francis on what? Does Pope Francis teach that the church's teaching on same-sex acts can change? If so, where? You're in full agreement with him that the church can't reverse these things? Is that why you said no, 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 no? Because it does seem that there's things that Pope Francis has said that would indicate that he doesn't think the church's teachings can change here. So when you say you're in full agreement with Pope Francis, on what? And then how do I know? Do you think you're in full agreement with him, but you're not? Are you in fact... And again, on what? Because to me, when I look at Pope Francis, there's some things that he says that I don't think that it would say, hey, it's okay to overturn the church's consistent teachings on morality here. I don't see that. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Pope Francis has said that somewhere. I've seen his comments, believe me. But none of those would lead me to this conclusion from what I've seen. Um, however, there are some things that he said that would make me think that he, he doesn't think that we can take that route. Moreover, I, it doesn't really matter what Pope Francis's personal opinion is here anyway. Let's say Pope Francis has a deficient understanding of the church's um, magisterium on this issue. That's still irrelevant to me because what has he actually promulgated that has overturned this? And you might say, well, he, if he has a deficient understanding in his mind, he might promulgate that in his magisterium. But wait, so you don't believe that the Holy Spirit protects the magisterium? You say... Oh, well, it only protects it in something as cathedral. That's not what the church itself teaches. Um, so that's not true. The Holy Spirit is also going to protect the authoritative, non-definitive teachings. So I don't think that the Holy Spirit would even allow Pope Francis to impose some kind of deficient understanding, even if he has one. And I still haven't conceded that he has one here. But again, if he does, and the two, the Cardinal and the Pope, are, just have deficient understandings personally, that's not going to overturn the magisterium. Now, I grant that could still do some destruction, right? It could certainly do destructive destruction. As I've said, you don't have to change the church's teachings to destroy souls. And I'm not saying that Pope Francis intends to. I'm just saying net result. Um, a pope could be completely immoral in his behavior. He doesn't touch the magisterium, but let's say he's living scandalously. Wouldn't that destroy some souls? Yes. Well, he didn't touch the magisterium, right? But you don't have to in order to be a scandal to people. That's true of every individual. That's true of a pope. That's true of a bishop. That's true of me as a layman. That's true of everybody. We can all be a stumbling block to people in the way that we live. That still doesn't touch on the matter of what the gentleman is asking here on whether or not the church's teaching has changed or can change. Uh, so I don't think that the cardinal really engaged his questions, but I'm at least glad that, hey, he he, he, he tried to somewhat um, and allowed himself to be videotaped for it. Uh, I'll give him that. A lot of people won't do that these days. But I appreciate the way this layman responded. I really appreciate it. Watch this. Nice. And then, uh, 
I know that I am in full agreement with Pope Francis. Thank you. He says, thank you for your time, God bless. I appreciate that. That's the right way to respond. We don't need to respond to them in a way that's going to confirm their suspicions about us, that we are dissenters and that we're just out to get them or something. We need to show them that we love Christ, we love the church, and we just simply want to be faithful to Christ and his teachings and the teachings of the church. They need to see that. So I appreciate the way he handled himself there. And, you know, I am disappointed at the end of the day in the Cardinal because I think that, number one, it shows the Cardinal has some deficient understandings about the faith, and he didn't really engage the question sufficiently in my estimation. But let's watch this response that was offered. Well, let's actually see two responses. First of all, there's, I guess, a traditionalist. He says, I stand with Father Altman here. I haven't really looked at his profile. I'm just pulling it up. So I guess he's a radical traditionalist. What percentage age of Catholics you know are aware that the Pope is on board with the efforts of Cardinal Hollerich, a key synod leader, to redefine doctrine on this? But wait. How do you know that he's on board with that? You might say, well, he chose him as the realtor, right? Or realtor, however you want to pronounce it. Realtor general. Um, doesn't that mean that he's on board with his views? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm still a little unclear what the Cardinal actually believes about this, but I suspect that his views are probably deficient here. Does that then mean that Pope Francis's views are deficient? Not necessarily, but it could be. Maybe Pope Francis does have some deficient views here. Maybe Pope Francis does think that the church is teaching here could change. I still don't believe that he's going to promulgate a document in his magisterium overturning that for the reasons why I've explained. So I, I'm not alarmed, although I am concerned if there's an individual who has a deficient understanding, including the Holy Father. That is concerning because there are additional problems that could happen as a result of that that don't touch on the church's magisterium so it, it's certainly problematic if it's true but i want to say it doesn't logically follow so i think that the radical traditionalist here is taking a leap um moreover the church itself says that the senate of bishops does not have the authority to overturn anything again in 343 it's for the senate of bishops to discuss the question for consideration and express its wishes but to resolve them but not to resolve them or issue decrees about them, unless in certain cases the Roman pontiff has endowed it with deliberate, but deliberative power, which he has not, and no pope has. In which case he ratifies the decisions of the Senate. Um, in other words, the opinion of the Senate of Bishops is just that. It's an opinion. And they'll give it to the pope and he'll consider it. At the end of the day, whether or not it's actually going to be taught boils down to the pope's magisterium. So the Synod of Bishops doesn't have the authority to change anything. What is the Realtor General? Here's what he is. He's a person who discusses, coordinates the discussion on the theme of the Synod Assembly and the elaboration of any documents to be submitted to the Assembly. So he coordinates the discussions. Does he have the authority to change any teaching? No. Now, somebody who coordinates discussions, can they coordinate them in such a way that they're pivoting it in a certain direction rather than the other? Of course. Obviously. Obviously. So is it a wise decision to make him um, the realtor general? Probably not. But maybe Pope Francis has some other reasons we haven't considered, but I don't think we have to say that was the best decision. But can the cardinal overchange any, overturn anything? No, but he can direct discussions kind of one way or another. But let's say he directs them in the wrong way. Okay, at the end of the day, the... Senate of bishops will put forward a document that has some problems in it. Is it authoritative? No. It's just their opinion. Okay. So an opinion is now given to the Pope. All right. What's the Pope now going to do? You might say, well, if he's given a bad opinion, then he's going to promulgate a false teaching. It, again, do you believe that the Holy Spirit guides the magisterium or not? Even if he's given a bad opinion, it doesn't mean he's going to promulgate something bad in his magisterium. Um, so I don't agree with the response here of uh, this individual on Twitter, the radical traditionalist. I also don't agree with what seems to be a liberal who's commenting on this. Um, here's what they say. 
I wish he would have asked Cardinal Holeric about the ordination of women. Well, why do we have to do that when Ordinatio Sacerdotalis already definitively settled it, which was already definitively settled before Ordinatio Sacerdotalis? Anyway, if you're in the church hoping that it's going to change its teachings on ordination of women, um, you might be in the wrong church. You might want to consider your reasons for being in the church. If the church changes its teaching on sodomy, but not on the ordination of women, then a lot of us are through with this institution. Well, I then have to ask your question, um, person on Twitter. Um, are you really in the church for the right reasons? Are, are you sure you're in the church for the right reasons? If that's enough for you to leave over, although I don't believe the church would ever change its teachings on the issues being described here. But if it doesn't change its teaching where you want it to change, you're out the door. Okay, so I want to say you might not be here for the right reasons to begin with. So you may want to reevaluate why you're here and whether or not you actually have pure and holy intentions of being here. Moreover, I suspect what's underlying this individual's um, comments here is they're really in the church at the end of the day for some other reason than I want to follow Christ and obey him. Because if you want to follow Christ and obey him, you're going to follow his teachings regardless of whether or not they line up with what you want. So even if you want the church to change its teachings on these issues, that's not the question. The question isn't what you want. The question is, what has Christ given us? And do we have the authority to change that? And if the answers to those questions are no, then it doesn't matter what you want. doesn't matter what your personal preference is. doesn't matter what your Christmas wish list is for Jesus. It doesn't matter. Are you going to conform yourself to Christ? You're supposed to be conformed into the image and likeness of Christ. Are you willing to do that? Or are you going to say, you know what, Jesus, I only serve you if you happen to fall in agreement with what I believe. If that's your approach, that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing here, right? What it is, is we follow Christ first, and then we listen to him. Whatever he teaches, we assent to that, regardless of it's, whether it's something we would have come up with or not, and what we like or not. We assent to it. We accept it. Intellect and will. Holy, interiorly. Not just externally. We accept it. Because we don't get to determine what truth is. Jesus testifies to what truth is since he is the truth. And you can't say, well, maybe Jesus testifies to it, but the church doesn't. But wait, it was Jesus who established the church. And it was Jesus who gave it the Holy Spirit to guide it into all truth. And you might say, well, maybe he's now guiding us into all truth. Uh, so we weren't being led into all truth for 2,000 years? That's a problem then for the Holy Spirit. That's absurd. Moreover, the church is the pillar of the truth. Where has it been for 2,000 years if it's not been on the side of the truth here? Well, it has been on the side of the truth. So in other words, the relationship between the teachings of the church and Christ himself are not something that you could just completely sever. They go hand in hand. He who hears you hears me. He who doesn't listen to you doesn't listen to me. Or him who sent me. And I suspect and I fear that people are saying things like this. If the church doesn't change, I'm out. What I'm hearing is unless the teachings of Jesus lines up with what I want to believe, I'm out the door. Well, were you here to begin with? Were you really here? Maybe sacramentally you were, but were you really living the sacraments? Were you really living the faith? Did you really have the right intentions? If you leave because... Christ doesn't line up with your thoughts and your words and your intentions and your beliefs and preferences, then that's called idolatry. You've created a Christ in your own image and likeness rather than listening, listening to the actual true Christ and his church. You're just engaging in idolatry then. So I found that liberal commentary alarming as well. And I want to say both of y'all are wrong. Liberal, you're wrong. Radical traditionalists, you're wrong because you're also making some leaps and assumptions here. On number one, whether or not Pope Francis interiorly agrees with any change. And then number two, whether or not that could actually be promulgated in its magisterium. Now, setting both of those 
issues to the side, both of them, the liberal commentary and the rad trad commentary, we can put them to the side. Are there still problems that we need to address in the church concerning this issue? Yeah. Are there still issues? Um, and will there not, will there be consequences and perhaps bad ones on how the Senate of bishops goes? Yeah, sure. Again, um, a person's behavior, their own moral conduct, their private opinions uh, that are expressed to others. And here, private, I'm contrasting that with the universal magisterium. Um, that a private opinion that could even be expressed publicly but not authoritatively, that could still be destructive to people. So, um, you know, Arius never you know, authoritatively taught his heresy, but he didn't have to in order to destroy souls. Um, so, I mean, I still have concerns. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, I do trust the, the Holy Spirit to guide his church. And I trust the, the teaching authority of the church, which I know a lot of liberals don't. And I'm even seeing a lot of conservative Catholics no longer trusting the magisterium and also holding to some deficient views there. I'm seeing I'm seeing both of those do it. And so I want, I want to say, you know what, both of y'all are wrong. <laughs> Neither one of y'all are actually listening to the magisterium properly. Um, but that's, again, a, a problem of its own. So I'm not trying to say there's no issues in the church today. There are, but I think some of the approaches that people are taking, some of the commentary that they're offering, it's deficient. You can't ultimately rest in the comfort that God will guide his church, um, and that includes his magisterium. Um, that doesn't, however, mean that we aren't to be a part of that and we aren't to express our concerns. We, we certainly need to do that. But let's just remain level-headed. That's all I'm saying. Uh, looking through the chat here, seeing if there's anything. If you have any questions, put them in the chat to at Reason and Theology. Do my best to answer them. I'll answer for uh, just a few minutes here. Yeah, so what is this? Could you go over the issues with the Morse Letitia in a separate video? Yes, 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 yes. Some say Pope Francis disagrees with Veritatis Splendor. Yeah, that last part I think is, is um, uh, I've, I've looked at that and it seems that they're equivocating some terms. So I, I don't think that that's the true uh, understanding. I don't think that he's overturning anything in Veritatis Splendor. I think, you seem, I think there's issues of equivocation there. But I'm aware that some respected people maintain that position of discontinuity. Um, yeah, as far as Amor Satitia, I do intend to do a whole video on that soon. So I'll, I'll address that. Um, for now, however, you can watch my interview with Dr. Brugger, um, because I do think that has some implications on the discussion today. Although I don't agree with Dr. Brugger's um, perspective on everything, uh, I do appreciate him. And he's going to be back on the show. So I'm going to talk to him about some of those things, some of the things we agree on, and maybe some of the things with, that uh, I, I, might, I might have a different um, perspective on and, and just see what he says. Maybe maybe he, he ends up agreeing with me. Maybe I had a misunderstanding of what he thought, and maybe we're actually in agreement. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, let's see here. Looking through the chat. Hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed this stream. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hope it has brought you some peace because there are people flipping out right now <laughs> on social media thinking that the the, the world is uh, almost over and that the church has lost its ways. Uh, I do believe there are some people in the church who have lost their way. Um, but but the church is not headed to destruction. That's uh, it's not what it is. Let's, let's keep a level-headed approach here. Um, okay, so here's a great question from Pish. Even if papal documents are safe, can the ambig ambiguities of these documents be harmful per se? This is a good question. Perceptive, very perceptive. Good question. Okay. I want to answer your question, yes. However, I would challenge the vast majority of instances that people try to use as a case of ambiguity. But here's why I would say, yeah, an ambiguity could be harmful. But it's not necessarily because of the creator of the document, but it's more on part of the interpreter who's interpreting it in a discontinuous way. So 
we have obligations as in people who are reading a document to read it in a harmonious sense. Um, so if you're reading it with discontinuity, um, you better make sure that you've crossed your T's, dotted your I's, and the vast majority of people don't. So I want to say the problem isn't necessarily the magisterium there. The problem is the individual who's then reading it and interpreting it in a negative way. Now, you might say, but the church could be more clear in it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Is that necessarily harmful to souls? No, but it isn't also the best way to guide souls either. Now, is it? No, it isn't. So when we say safe, we don't mean the best way. We don't mean the most prudent. We don't mean the best expressed. But what we're saying is if I assent to it, I won't go to hell. That's what we're saying. If you assent to the proper understanding of the text, are you going to go to hell? No. Can you twist the text and read it in a discontinuous way? In a way that is now discontinuous with sacred tradition and will that impact your soul maybe but that's not exactly because of the magisterium that's now more you as an interpreter that have faults however the magisterium could have done a better job at making it more explicit i grant that the the problem here is we've had this problem from day one nicaea one doesn't sufficiently address the consubstantiality of the holy spirit it just doesn't it doesn't that was not addressed at the council uh, partly because there would have been some fathers there that wouldn't have accepted it. Um, did Ephesus really address everything? No. Some of the 12 anathemas sounded Apollinarian. Because as I showed, um, Cyril unknowingly, he thought he was drawing on Athanasius. It was actually pseudo-Athanasius was an Apollinarian. So Cyril, not being an Apollinarian, rejecting Apollinarianism, was drawing on upon an Apollinarian content to express his theology. That was just confusing everybody. And that's then read in the Acts of Ephesus. So then some people started thinking, well, Cyril and Ephesus are Apollinarians. They're not. <laughs> but, but you can understand why some people would have that suspicion. John of Antioch did. You might say, well, a big, again, it's not legitimate. Okay, but it was still pretty ambiguous, right? Or somewhat ambiguous. I don't fault again Cyril or Ephesus, but I'm just saying it can sound Apollinarian and you can then twist it. What do you do then? Well, that's why we then have Chalcedon. All right. Well, does Chalcedon tie up all loose ends on the three chapters? No. All right. So that led to some confusion, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had a lot of discord and ambiguity going on there and then constantinople tried to tie that up but not so sure it really was successful in the end constantinople too since we still have a schism over this issue i'm not so sure it was entirely successful um although i accept ephesus chalcedon and constantinople too don't get me wrong i'm just saying i'm not not so sure that it cleared up all the ambiguities and then we have the six ecumenical council to tie up more loose ends because there's some things that if you take Cyril the wrong way, you take Ephesus the wrong way, it's then going to sound like, well, Jesus doesn't have two wills. So monothelitism. Now we have that whole controversy. So again, we, we can continue to do this with all of, you know, most of the councils. There's, there's ambiguities there. Are the ambiguities necessarily harmful to souls? I would answer no but it could be harmful to souls if you interpret it incorrectly but that's not because of the document it's more because of the interpreter however could the document and could the magisterium have done a better job to explain itself so that people could not misunderstand it as easily yeah yeah hope hopefully that uh answers your question sufficiently mm. imagine if social media existed in the first millennium y yeah mm-hmm Imagine it existed in the time of Ephesus, Chalcedon, and Constantinople II, and Constantinople III, and Nicaea II. And Nicaea I, for that matter. Let's just go ahead and throw it in for good measure. Imagine all of the you know, seven councils there, the first seven ecumenical councils. Throw in the eighth, too. That one was pretty, all kinds of twists and turns there. Imagine the first eight ecumenical councils. We had social media for them. <laughs> You think that things today are bad? You you just haven't read church history for some of these things. <laughs> some pretty wacky stuff going on. 
a lot of confusion in pretty much every age of the church. <sighs> okay, what else? Hmm. What is meant by God and by the Holy Spirit? I did a whole video on this just recently. When it comes to the magisterium and the Pope, does God move free will if they have um, deficient understanding? Now, that I didn't address, but in but the first part I did address in a video, uh, I want to say it was last week. It is called... Um, it is called... Well, can disciplinary decrees be harmful to the souls? That obviously what I'm going to say there also then applies to non-definitive teachings. Because if it applies to a disciplinary decree, it would apply to things higher to that. Such as non-definitive teachings. So watch that one. Um, but in answer to your second question, does God move free will if they have deficient understanding? Now that's a good question. I don't think that God overrides free will. Um, but I just think providentially he's not going to allow that person to express that deficient um, deficient understanding in a magisterial document. How does that work? I don't know. Ask God. Don't know. Uh, I don't think he's overriding free will, though. Mm. Um, he, he, he could help that person through grace realize that they should not. Uh, address it, maybe have them realize it's not timely and they just don't address it for that reason. Um, could the papacy ever be truly vacant for over 60 years? Is this prohibited by the Holy Spirit? I just think that's discontinuous with Pastor Eternus, um, that there would be perpetual successors to the See of St. Peter. Um, if we can go 60, 70 years without successors, I think the definition of perpetual has been falsified. So I think Vatican I has been falsified if you take the set of contests view, which is why a lot of set of contests don't remain set of contests and they become Eastern Orthodox, because they connect the dots. Um, let's see. So Denise asks, so we need a synod to determine if sodomy is a sin. I don't know who here is arguing that. Uh, I'm certainly not arguing that, and that doesn't follow from anything I've said. Um, but I do know that there are some people who certainly want the Synod to overturn that, but as I demonstrated in this video, the Synod can't overturn that. Um, she says, I'm talking about the Cardinal. What does the Cardinal believe here? Does he believe that it can change? You know, if, if you have, if you ask me, you have to choose one, he thinks it can change or he thinks it can't change. I would think it's safer to say, I think he thinks it could change. But I don't know that for sure based on what he said, but I have seen from that video, it sure makes me think he's in that direction. I don't think he's in the direction of continuity. Doesn't sound like it to me, but maybe I'm reading too much into him. I want to be charitable to him. I'm just saying if I had to guess which direction he's going, I think he's going for the direction that he thinks that this can develop. Um, and what I and, and let me re, let me modify that not develop because develop can be something that's not substantially discontinuous. I think he thinks that this could be overturned. The church's teachings on morality can be reversed entirely, substantially. Uh, uh -huh -huh. Okay, seeing a lot of questions that aren't relevant to our topic here so hold those perhaps for a video where i do and ask me anything and i'd be happy to answer them uh for these i'm going to try to stick to something that's that's relevant to here um yeah so what's the difference between withholding assent and dissenting as stated in donum veritatis yeah so i used to think that there wasn't a difference but there actually is a difference um, there is a difference between an inability to assent to something, you know, struggling to assent. You're open to assent to it if you can see how it's the case, right? You're so so you're open to assent to it, but you just haven't committed to assenting to it. There's a difference between that and dissenting. Dissenting is I'm opposed to this. I am going to oppose it. That's not the same as I'm open to this. I'm just ha having a difficulty actually assenting. They're not the same thing. 
Uh, and I don't think Dona Veritatis allows for any kind of dissent. Uh, moreover, the people who that it does address about withholding assent very technically is in relation to theologians with a mandate who have done due diligence in, in an area of non-definitive teachings that they're struggling with. That's all it's talking about. Is that most people? No. Um, are most people right now currently competent enough to make that kind of determination? No. Most people aren't trained in theology. Most people aren't trained in the magisterium. So they're not in a position to where they could even make that determination. So anybody who's trying to use Dona Veritatis to prove that, not only do I think Dona Veritatis is not allowing for dissent, um, it would also I would also argue they're not in a position to meet the description of what Dona Veritatis is talking about anyway. By the way, there's also stuff in Dona Veritatis that talks about the theologian not going to social media and start using social media or mass media, it says. Um, I think we can also uh, include social media here. It tells them not to go to social media to start blasting their their disagreement with the magisterium. It says sometimes they need to suffer in silence. That's what Dona Veritatis says. Sometimes they need to suffer in silence. How does that work with some theologians that I see all over YouTube making all kinds of appearances, dissenting from the magisterium and openly calling other people to dissent? How does that work out with Dona Veritatis? Moreover, I mean, they're supposed to be signing off on the profession of faith and agreeing to third paragraph teachings. But more, more importantly, the whole going to social media thing, Dona Veritatis has, I think, spoken about that. So. Anytime you see professional theologian all over social media dissenting from the magisterium, I think they're doing so against Dona Veritatis. Make of that whatever you will. And please don't bring up Canon 212 because Canon 212 doesn't allow for you to dissent. Um, and Canon 212 is also, again, uh, uh, not, not about the professionally trained theologian that Dona Veritatis is speaking about. Um... Mm. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, why do you think many European bishops seem to prefer ambiguity to clarity? Seems like they can't answer a question directly or clearly, at least many of them, not all of them or some. Well, yeah, I mean, I certainly want to qualify that, right? Um, let me let, let's rephrase it. Why is it that some bishops prefer ambiguity to clarity? Let's just rephrase it because that's true, right? Uh, I think we know why. I think some of them it's because they know that they can capitalize on the ambiguity. Maybe in other cases, it's not because they're trying to capitalize on the ambiguity, um, but they want perhaps an individual to determine these things in their conscience or something. I, I could think of multiple intentions, but I, I could certainly say that I would imagine some people would have the intention of capitalizing on ambiguity. I hesitate to accuse any individual of that because it's I would have to then know their intentions, and it's kind of hard to read a person's intentions unless, unless you're really just certain, and it's so painfully obvious by their external behavior. I try to avoid the inter interior judgments. And I do know there's a time where you could finally say, look, it's so clear by your external actions that this is what your interior disposition is. I just I want to avoid that in some cases. Uh, who brings the dissenters to accountability? Well, the magisterium is supposed to do that. Um, is it failing in disciplining some people? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's what I've been saying. I've been saying the problem in the post-conciliar era is a lack of discipline. But that's also a problem in the pre-conciliar era many aspects of the preconciliar era. People were tolerated to say all kinds of things that they should have never tolerated or maintained. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Can someone argue that Catholic rulings on gay marriage were a scientific mistake a la geocentrism? So what you have to be able to do is say that the question on same-sex acts uh, and then unions is one entirely of science and fact. And I would say it's not entirely one of science and fact. It includes acts of morality. And that is within the competency of the church to weigh in on acts of morality. Uh, whereas geocentrism doesn't per se deal with matters of faith or morals, despite some fathers thinking that it did. 
it doesn't per se. It's more an, an issue of fact and science, not necessarily faith and morals. Now, one might say, but you have secondary objects of infallibility where the church can rule on a matter of fact. Yes, but those are matter of facts that are intimately related to something in sacred scripture. Somebody might argue, well, geocentrism is one of those fa factual matters that directly relates to the book of Joshua or something like that. I understand that you think that privately, but the magisterium doesn't agree with you. And it's the magisterium that gets to make that judgment, not you as an individual. So are we going to now say that the magisterium has defected from the faith? Or are we going to say, well, no, I don't get to determine those things privately. I don't get to determine what is a, pri a secondary object of infallibility over against the magisterium. I don't get to do that. The magisterium does. And the magisterium hasn't weighed in on the issue of... Um, this matter definitively. Um, though I know that there are some people who argue that. But again, that's them privately arguing it when it's clear that the, the church is not arguing that. Mm, okay. Didn't the Western schism have a 40-year-long empty papacy? No. Go check your facts again. Um, the length of the Western schism doesn't mean that there was a period of time where the sea was vacant. Those are not the same thing. Uh, Michael says, great discussion. Michael, I appreciate, uh, you take the time to address. Thanks. I appreciate it. Hope this has been helpful. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, am I doing more shows today? Well, I have one at 3.30 3 with Louis Dizon, who's going to do a part two on uh, problems with the Quran. Uh, so maybe in, in Islamic apologetics as well. So tune in for that. I might end up doing some uh, patron-only shows, some exclusive shows for those who are channel members and patrons. So if you want to become a channel member or a patron, patreon.com forward slash reason at theology, or just hit the join button, you know, here on YouTube, uh, you'll get access to those. Um, all right. So I think uh, we'll end it there. We're right at an hour. So I appreciate y'all watching. Hope this has been helpful. Hope... Uh, Y'all realize the sky isn't falling. However, we do still have issues that we need to be concerned about, and we need to address them um, and do our best to present the faith, but we need to also do so in charity. Don't forget that. I need to remember it. <laughs> I know I for sure need to remember it because sometimes I don't want to be charitable. So we have to work on that. We have to fight against those uh, those re remaining effects of... Uh, of, of original sin, namely concupiscence. All right, we'll see you later. God bless. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.